When I work with different organizations, it always amazes me uh, how frequently I hear an expression like this, you know, why don't we have any fresh ideas? We can't come up with any new perspectives. We can't, you know, come, come up with anything innovative. Uh, and then I look around and everybody there is basically the same, the whole organization. They've hired a bunch of people that are just like themselves. And so they don't have any diversity there. And so that's my first comment is, well, you don't have any fresh ideas because you all have the same perspective. And it may be a good perspective, but you need some diversity in here of all sorts. So in this video, we want to talk a little bit about working in diverse teams, because that's what we should be looking for is in involvement and engagement in diverse teams, which comes with lots of benefits and also some challenges. So let's address all of that and discuss why this is important and what we can do to enhance our ability to work in diverse teams. So first of all, let's define group diversity real quick. Diversity is just group diversity is persons with varying characteristics, including cognitive skills, personality traits, and factors that shape our identities, such as race, age, gender, religion, sexual orientation, cultural background, etc. So uh, when we say diversity, automatically, a lot of times we think, you know, race and ethnicity, and certainly that is diversity. And that's those are important perspectives as well as, you know, age, gender, and those, those different kinds of characteristics are important that we have diversity in that regard in our group, because, uh, you know, people from those different backgrounds come with different perspectives and we should want that. We should want, you know, different viewpoints and different uh, the people with different experiences to bring different ideas. And so, yes, absolutely. That is a part of group diversity. And if you look around and everybody in the group looks just like you, then that's, that's going to be a problem, but that's not the only way we can define diversity diversity and should define diversity. Diversity includes things like cognitive skills or just different ways of thinking. You know, some people are more um, straightforward and, and, you know, kind of in the way that they process information. And some people are more creative, you know, that whole idea of left brain, right brain, which is kind of coming to question, but you get the idea that, so we want people with different cognitive skills. We want people with different personality traits because mixing all that together is where you start to find ways to complement one another and fill in those gaps that, that you may not have as an individual or as a, as a certain type of person, but you can fill in those gaps by bringing in people from other backgrounds. So your group ideally should be as diverse as possible. That's what you want. I was thinking of this too, in terms of sports. So in basketball, for example, you can have one player kind of take over the game in professional basketball in particular. But in baseball, I love baseball and I love the St. Louis Cardinals in particular, go Cardinals. But, uh, but I love baseball because it takes an entire team. You need that diversity, right? You can't just have a team of great hitters and just the worst pitching ever and still expect to do well and vice versa. You know, you gotta have, you gotta have enough hitters, solid hitters, but you also have to have a great pitching staff. You have to have people who can play in the field well. And, and so you need all of that diversity and different personalities and different things in the clubhouse, all the, the kind of off the field stuff too. You need people to fill those roles. So you need a lot of diversity to make, you know, a really good professional baseball team, which is one of the things I love about the Cardinals. They do a great job of putting together these teams. They don't win every year, obviously, but they win plenty, um, you know, especially in comparison to the Cubs, for example, they win plenty of World Series, but every year they're competitive, it seems like. There's very few years in there are competitive because they understand the importance of a diverse team in, in all regards, on the field, off the field, in all aspects of the game. So in your group, we ought to be looking for that diversity, somebody who sees M, but also somebody who sees W, right? We want that kind of diversity and to, to bring a completeness to our team. So what does that do for us? We know that there are a variety of impacts from diversity, positive effects that come from diversity, um, starting with the fact that diverse groups are more effective in decision-making and problem-solving. And you bring all those different perspectives together. You bring all those different viewpoints together and experiences and, and just all of that together. And you're going to get more effective at decision-making and problem solving in the long run. Let me, let me, you know, that comes with an asterisk. This is after you've come together as a team. Now that can be a challenge and we'll talk about that in, a, in, in just a moment. But, uh, but when you get together as a team, when you put all the pieces together and things are running smoothly, then we know that, that diverse teams are more effective in decision-making and problem solving than homogenous teams. So the other thing that we know about diverse teams is that, that we see an increase in innovation. Right. When you have these homogenous teams, these teams that look alike and think alike, and, and, and we see this in organizations historically, you look at organizations that, that oftentimes fail in the long run, they'll have this enormous surge and they'll think, oh, well, this is who we are. This is what we ought to do. So we hire a bunch of people that are just like us because we want to keep that going. Right. 
but then it gets stale and you don't think outside the box and you, you know, you end up falling off. Right. So think about like IBM back in the day, IBM was a huge organization, but they got to be so big that they got to be so homogenous that there was very little creativity and they were very much, you know, not to use a cliche, but inside the box thinking, right? So that when Steve jobs brings them Apple computers, and Steve Wozniak bring them Apple, the idea for Apple, they say, no, 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 that's not what we do. That's not us. And they let them go. And they, they so they have no stake in this. And then eventually you know, IBM has fallen off. Uh, they're no longer one of the biggest companies in the world, you know, no longer all that importance because they saw that decrease in innovation, diverse teams bring an increase in innovation. When you bring in different people, different perspectives, different experiences, then you bring in different ideas, different ways of doing things, and you continue to innovate in that way. So diverse teams see an increase in innovation. Diverse teams also see a decrease in groupthink. And we're going to talk just for a minute here about what groupthink is, but you know, to start with, it's bad. Groupthink is bad. And so when you have a homogenous team, you start to see more groupthink. Diverse teams see less groupthink. So what is groupthink? Well, groupthink is the practice of thinking or making decisions as a group in a way that discourages creativity or individual responsibility. So groupthink essentially says that, okay, we're going to go along. We're going to, you know, we're just get caught up in the, in the momentum, in the flow here. And we're going to, we're going to do things the way that, uh, that the leader says we should do them or the way that the group seems to be trending, despite the fact that we may have these voices in the back of our head saying, no, this is a bad idea. This is, I have questions about this, or I think there's a different way of doing this that might work out better, but I don't want to say that because I don't want to be the standout in the group, but you know, the, there's an expression in Japanese that says the nail that stands out gets hammered, right? And I don't want to be the nail that gets hammered. I'm just going to go along. So we get into group think, and then we all end up just falling off the cliff together, right? Because we're just following along. We're not really thinking. So we just, okay, well, that person fell off the cliff. So I must be supposed to be fall, falling off the cliff as well, right? One example of this that we see in fairly contemporary history is in 2003, the U.S. invasion of Iraq is an example of groupthink, a classic example of groupthink. You had this kind of momentum. First of all, people were feeling pressure about, um, you know, we need to to respond to 9-11. We were already in Afghanistan. And so um, there's this pressure that things aren't happening quickly enough. And so people are feeling pressure to make things happen and, and get things done in the wake of 9-11. And so we get this whisper of weapons of mass, mass destruction in Iraq. And so then everybody grabs onto that and says, oh, well, this is something we can do and, and should do. And you know, all along, you, you hear from people all the time who are saying, for example, Secretary, then Secretary of State Colin Powell has said in a book, I had, I had reservations. I had concerns about whether or not our intelligence was accurate and that kind of thing. But he readily admits them too. But I didn't say so loudly enough and I didn't object because I went along. I just thought this is what we were supposed to do. So he got caught up in that group thinking everybody did. And we ended up then starting a war in Iraq, expanding the war in the Middle East to Iraq over something that wasn't there it has been determined that there were no weapons of mass destruction uh, like we thought there were. That was false information. and But people got so caught up in that. That's an example of groupthink. It's sort of in more modern uh, context. We can see this in uh, sorry, it, with uh, the way we view cable news, right? Fox News and MSNBC, both, not to pick a side. Um, and in fact, I'm not really crazy about either, to be honest, but Fox News and MSNBC are examples of groupthink in, in some ways. You know, in some ways they're news organizations and they provide effective information and things like that. But in other ways, it, they're examples of groupthink because people just stop questioning the accuracy of things and stop questioning, you know, are, are they telling us the right things? Are they being honest with us? Or, you know, and we know now in today, and so the making of this video, um, we're, we're just coming off the settlement of the Dominion uh, voting machines lawsuit against Fox News, claiming that Fox News knowingly lied about and put people on the air who lied about what was happening in the voting machines during the, um, during the 2020 election, presidential election, right? And we know from texts and, and emails and different things like that, that the personalities at Fox News knew that this was false uh, for sure. Right. I and mean, they've said, you know, this was false. We, 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 we put these people on knowing that it was crazy. They said it was literally said it was crazy. All of this just came out. Right. And yet you hear people, Fox News people, not, not Fox News personalities, but people who watch Fox News still saying, eh, I don't care. They're, they're my, they're my station. I don't care. You know, I don't care that they knowingly lied to us for, for the last couple of years and that kind of thing. 
but we're just going to keep following along. That is groupthink, my friends. That is groupthink. People do it on both sides. People do it with MSNBC as well, although we haven't had reports on MSNBC's just outright lying about things in the same way that we have about Fox News. But still, you get the idea that we get into these echo chambers. We get this momentum of following these things. And then we feel like personally it might cost us more to be wrong about that. So we just, we just go along with it and we, we buy into it even more. We double down and that's group think. And that's, that's an issue. So diversity in a group decreases that because people are more willing to say no, they're willing to raise their hand and say, no, I don't think that's the right thing to do. Let's, we ought to look at it from, from this perspective or in a different way and try it in a different way. When you have diversity in a group, you see the decrease of groupthink within that group, which is critical. Now, this is none of this is to say that diversity is easy in groups. Diversity is something we should want and should strive for. It also presents a number of challenges within a group as we as we look at group work. So let's take a look at what some of those are. First of all, you see when you bring diverse people together, you're going to see different styles of communication. They're coming from different cultures, different communication backgrounds. So you see, for example, high context and low context communicators. High context communicators tend to look beyond the verbal expression. So let me start with this. Low context people look more at the verbal expression and they take people at their word and they say, well, that's what they said. So that's what it must be. And they just kind of it's like looking through the peephole of a door. Right. Instead of, you know, opening the door and seeing the whole perspective, you're only looking at that one specific and, you know, defined area. Low context communication looks specifically at verbal communication and goes from there. High context communicators, though, will take a look at other aspects of communication. They'll take more, uh, they'll put more into the nonverbals and different things like that of, uh, of the communicator and the history between the two and what their position is and all of those types of things. They will look at, at, uh, at different you know, contexts. Again, they broaden their context and look at different things outside of the verbal aspect of things. So when you have people from both of those different backgrounds, then you have to figure out, okay, who's who and how does that impact? How do I need to adjust how I hear what this person says and the input they, they provide and how I communicate with this person based on the differences in our views of, you know, high context or low context communicators. So we have to adjust our communication styles overall and, and be more aware of those types of things. We also look at accents and fluency. If you're, if you're dealing with people who aren't speaking the same primary language, Okay, so if I'm, English is my primary language and I speak a little bit of Spanish, but not much. But if I'm working with somebody whose primary language is, you know, Chinese and they speak English, so we may communicate in English, but I also have to understand that that may be more challenging for them and they may have trouble expressing their ideas the way that they want to. And so we may have to be more patient with that. Um, it's not that their ideas don't have merit or that they're not smart enough or whatever. It's just that, you know, they're having to work harder to put those ideas into a language that I can understand because we're speaking different languages, literally. So accents, fluency, those types of things, we have to take that into account and, you know, in some ways set it aside and remember that it's the idea that matters and not, you know, whether or not they have more trouble expressing it or I have more trouble understanding it because of those different, uh, uh, different aspects as well. We have different attitudes toward hierarchy. Okay. So uh, people from a, a high power distance culture put a lot of regard into um, to the placement of somebody within that organization, for example. And, and so if you're the leader of a group, they're not going to challenge you. If the leader of the group says, well, this is my thought and this is my idea, they're probably not going to challenge that because they come from a society where that's not encouraged. In the United States, that's not the case. We have a very low power distance culture here where we question people all the time. You know, it doesn't mean we can be disrespectful, but but we can question people. There's no, we don't see a specific, you know, inherent difference between some between us and somebody else just because they happen to have this job or that role or whatever. We're going to question those things regardless and be more comfortable doing so. But we have to recognize that if we're working with somebody who's from a different culture like that, they may not be as willing to to speak up. We may have to draw them out a little bit more and say, hey, it's OK. We want ideas just because I said this and I happen to be in a higher position doesn't mean that's the end of the discussion. We, I need you to contribute and to challenge. And so we need to be sensitive to those things. And then the decision making norms. You know, some societies are going to be more. Um, you know, in the United States, we we're we're a, a democratic republic, right? So we're used to more consensus, more more uh, uh, voting and 
you know, consensus and majority rules and that kind of thing type of uh, decision making as opposed to uh, 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 people from cultures that are more um, uh, that are that are more used to autocracy, for example, or for from a, again, if they're from a low power dis or high power distance culture, excuse me, they may be used to people just saying, well, this is what we're doing. One person's making the decision, the others are following along, and they may have some input and things, but but one person's going to make the decision. So they may be waiting for somebody else to kind of sp to speak up and say, this is what we're doing. They may not be as comfortable with the whole idea of voting and, and, uh, and majority rules and things. So we need to, to consider that there are different decision making norms for people from different cultures as well. We need to understand all these things and manage them, though, understanding that the payoff, again, for diversity is well worth the effort that it takes to to manage these things and to really um, consider these things and keep them in mind. When we consider the benefits of diverse groups, they far outweigh any of these challenges, which in the end are manageable. We just have to be aware of them as well as other things and manage those things. Um, and then we can get the, the benefits of that diversity in the groups. So we should be looking for as diverse a group as possible, whether it's a work team, whether it's, you know, whatever kind of team we're putting together, that diversity is only going to help us once we learn to, to manage those challenges and come together as a group, um, that, that diversity is going to pay big, big dividends for us. So it's well worth our time and energy to figure out the most effective ways of working in diverse groups, putting together and working in those diverse groups. If you have questions about, about group diversity or small group communication in general, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. And uh, in the meantime, I hope this gives you a new perspective on the importance and the, the benefits of diversity in small groups.